uh, welcome to another interview uh, in this special series of interviews conducted by Veda College in which we are reaching out to uh, artists and entrepreneurs from the AVGC industry uh, so that we can have an interaction with them on the current trends and how our students can prepare themselves better for the uh, industry in, and their future. So today we have with us uh, Mr. Ninath Chaya, uh, who is an entrepreneur and an avid gamer at heart. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in gaming and the interactive media space. He is currently the COO of uh, Wits Interactive, a design tech agency, uh, and the co-founder of Go Digital, an award-winning venture focused on providing immersive solutions using augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and gaming as the four core offerings. Prior to joining Wits Interactive, Ninad held leadership roles at premium mobile apps and game development companies in India, such as Robosoft Technologies, Reliance Games, and India Games, where he was instrumental towards their growth. So thank you very much, Ninath, for joining us uh, in this interview. Thank you, Rishal. Thank you for having me over on this show. My passion for games turned into a profession. So while I was in college, uh, the whole idea while I was doing my graduation with chemistry uh, as a subject of specialization, I still wanted to do something different. And this was in the mid 90s when even the internet was just newly launched in India. Uh, mm -hmm. So a, a friend of mine and I got talking uh, and we just kind of thought, hey, what do we do which is not kind of the run of the mill thing? I mean, it was, it was never a, uh, an intentional approach that, oh, I want to become an entrepreneur. It just naturally happened. And I uh, were, were brainstorming and we said, hey, the web is something coming up really fast and new. Uh, and we could kind of ride that wave on the, on the new internet uh, uh, spectrum to create websites for companies which are looking to get onto the digital domain. And that's how the first version, uh, which was more like a, a garage version of Wits Interactive started, where Hitesh, who is the founder and CEO of Wits Interactive, and I, both of us have been together since school, so kind of childhood friends and were together in college. And it's for companies who are looking to uh, hop onto the internet at that point of time. This was in the 95, 96 time frame. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the early days of Wits. And uh, after a couple of years, uh, and I was always kind of a gamer, like I mentioned, uh, and we said, I suddenly started saying, hey, you know what? The gaming uh, are making games, which means there has to be somebody making games for me to games. And that's how I said, okay, why not I give it a shot at games? And I kind of went out and, and met another friend of mine who became my founder of my first gaming company. So Vishal Gondal and I co-founded India's first gaming company, India Games. This was somewhere in the late 90s, around 98, 99. Mm -hmm. uh, which by then was, was on its own growth phase and Hitesh was running that organization. Uh, and because gaming was something which I was really passionate about, I said, well, let me give it my best to grow the gaming space in India. And, and uh, back then it was a very niche area. Not many people knew about gaming as such in India. Uh, people even today think it's a, uh, it's a frivolous activity. I mean, a lot of parents whom I interact with as a part of my uh, activities kind of say, hey, gaming is kind of there. It's taking away the focus from the studies. So you can imagine what it was back in the 90s where yes. even my... My family itself was kind of surprised that why, why me, a chemistry graduate uh, with an MSc in organic chemistry, I'm looking at getting into gaming. Very unconventional uh, for uh, those times. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but it was, it was always, like I said, it was never a conscious decision. It, I, I just kind of went along where I thought, hey, let me try out this something new. So that's how India Games came about. And then over the years, uh, so we, we built India Games into a, fairly good leading company in India. And then I'm on to another gaming company. Uh, so Reliance had its own gaming studio at that point of time called Paradox Studios, which is now known as Reliance Games and Zepak. So mm -hmm. I went and joined them to set up their, uh, to scale their gaming business. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was there for a fairly long time, almost seven, seven and a half years. Uh, so all through this journey, I was always looking at what is the next thing. Uh, so gaming is, is obviously an integral part of 
who I am. Even today, when I do my talks or my uh, uh, examples with people, when I talk to them, I try to find analogies to gaming. Uh, so after Jump Games, I joined, uh, I did my own startup, which was incubated by Nazara. Uh, so that was a startup called Playcaso, which was in the game publishing space. And mm -hmm. Nitish from Nazara is a dear friend over the past 20 years. We've been kind of, he was also one of the early guys in gaming at that point of time. So Nitish and I were in Playcaso, where it was meant to help independent game developers publish their games. Uh, so th that was Playcaso, for, which we ran for two years. Uh, post that, I went on to join. Uh, we, had to, we had to kind of put that into hibernation mode because of uh, the changing dynamics in the uh, gaming scenario. And I joined Robosoft Technologies, which is a, a very premium app development company to run their gaming business and app development business uh, in the space. Again, a lot of learning over there, uh, brilliant team. Uh, but then, then what happened was pretty much like a, a second homecoming where while I was at Robosoft, I was looking at, hey, what's next in the whole consumer engagement or, or uh, as a user, what do I want to do next? How do I interact with my surroundings? And that's how AR VR came about. And I came back to the mothership, which is Wits Interactive, and mm -hmm. we set up Go Digital. Uh, the whole idea being businesses today have a physical domain presence and a digital presence. Uh, consumers are interacting with both these domains uh, independently. How do you bridge the gap between the digital and the physical? And that's how Go Digital came about, where we said, hey, we'll leverage technologies like AR, VR, AI, gamification to help all the stakeholders of a business ecosystem engage with each other in a much better manner, in a much more immersive manner. So that's how Go Digital came about and almost four years into the AR, VR space. And it's been a really fun ride starting from a chemistry student to being there to building apps and now building AR, VR solutions. So a very interesting journey indeed. Uh, so what is your uh, source of motivation and inspiration that drove you on this uh, exciting journey as an entrepreneur and as an artist? So like I said, Rochelle, it was a conscious uh, decision, at least for me. And like, I, I didn't start out by saying, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it just happened that I was possibly lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. That, mm -hmm. So when, when we were building websites back in 95, Hitesh, my co-founder, he's a techie. I'm not a techie. So any idea which I would have, I would bounce it off with him and he would say, okay, let's try it out. So the whole, I, I think the, the key area is to be curious. I mean, for me, it was always that how does, how does something happen or, or how can we do it? That is what kept on driving me. Right? I was playing games as a kid, somewhere mm -hmm. in the back of my head, I was always thinking, okay, if I'm playing this game and I'm enjoying this game, somebody somewhere in some corner of the world has made this game. Yes. So how did that happen? And, and that's how I said, okay, let me try my hand at uh, building games. And, and I knew that I couldn't code. I mean, I'm not a techie. So I started creating game concepts. Right? Okay. I, I, uh, now, if I had to explain my game concept to an artist, to a programmer, I had to draw sketches and that's how my journey of becoming a game designer started so from a web designer to a game designer and then uh, it, it was just kind of a natural progression from there on and the idea is to tell a story tell a message how you do it what platform what technology you use is secondary as long as you're able to communicate to your audience what is it that is going on in your head so you uh, spoke about uh, telling a story and uh, mm -hmm. um, what I understand is that uh, the pre-production scenario in India uh, has started gaining uh, importance only recently. Uh, so what do you think is the, uh, you know, uh, the, the trend that we can see or expect in this pre-production scenario? So you're, you're right when you said that the pre-production scenario has started getting that importance that due uh, place in the whole life cycle of a project very recently, right? For a very long time, uh, pre-production pretty much went on in parallel with production. Even, even <laughs> when I was building games, I mean, the idea was to get, let's start and then we'll figure out how to go about. Mm. The best utilization of time of the whole team and, and very often it would lead to missions and burnout, uh, but Obviously, now that you see that the kind of quality which is coming out, be it in games, be it in 
films between animation studios out of India. So once your fundamentals are in place, it becomes a lot easier uh, for, for everybody to see the bigger picture. And that's what I think pre-production plays a really key role in nailing down the essentials, right? If it is a game, you need to first nail down the core of the fun, fun part of the game, that is that fun element in the game, which is the functionality. What is that USP of your game? And then mm-hmm. you build around it. The art comes secondary. The programming comes secondary. The, the first part is building in the fun part on, on why would a player want to keep coming back to your game to play it? How do you make it engaging? Likewise in films, I mean, or, or in animation, how do you make it more in audience be immersed in front of your screen for that particular period of time? So it is, it is important and uh, going forward with technology evolving, I think it will, it will be a lot more uh, better to, to kind of convey your ideas from that perspective. Very interesting. So, uh, could you also talk about the challenges that you have faced uh, uh, in your experience? So, it's, it's been a 22-year journey, right? 20 to 20 years. So, there have been a lot of interesting incidents. It, it's, been a, it's been a fun ride, right? From the time when uh, my dad was quite surprised that I wanted to move away from chemistry. So I come from a family uh, of academicians and medicals. From my mother's side, a majority of my family members are doctors. And my, from my father's side, most of them are academicians. And suddenly here was this guy who said, well, I will do my chemistry, but I don't want to pursue in the field of science or medicine. Mm-hmm. I want to do something in web or, or something in digital. Digital was a relatively unknown term. And here was this kid who said, hey, and, and even I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went ahead and while doing my master's, I, uh, uh, I went ahead and got the form for FTI in Pune, Film Institute. Because for uh-huh. me, that was the only course which, uh, there was a diploma course which taught about motion picture cinematography and story writing, script writing. Now, I did not know where I'll apply that, but I went ahead and get, got the form and people in my family thought that, hey, this guy wants to go and become an actor. And that kind of caused a lot of heartburn in the family. Saying, mm-hmm. Why do you want to kind of get into the film, in, film line? And I said, no, I don't. I don't want to go to the film line. And my dad asked me, why did you get the form? And I didn't have a clear answer. So he told me that, hey, you know what? Complete your post-graduation and then you can do whatever you want. Take these two years, do your degree course, do your post-graduation, and then figure out how you want to go about with your career. The, these, so I'm giving you two years to think it through. And those two years helped me figure out what I wanted to do. And that's how WITS came about, where we started building websites. Uh, then even when we started India Games, not everybody knew about gaming. So when we, got, when we raised our first round of investment, my dad was quite surprised that there are people who are willing to put money in a company which makes games. And uh, a lot of people around me were also surprised. So uh, I, I think it is when, when you are early stages of any new technology, it mm-hmm. is a bit of an interesting experience to convince people around you what you're doing. When we started Go Digital. Uh, around four years ago. Again, AR, VR was, I, I would not say a new, new concept, but a fairly new phenomenon in India. Globally, it has been around for a while. So the whole idea of explaining to people what augmented reality is or what virtual reality is, uh, again, was, was something people thought, oh, yeah, yeah, we've seen 3D movies. So we mm. know what AR, VR is. And then you have to explain to them that, no, AR is, so, so to give an example, analogy, I would kind of turn to movies and say, well, what Tony Stark does in his lab, right? Or, or what you see in Minority Report is mm-hmm. augmented reality. What Iron Man sees as a, as a visual layout in front of his helmet. And the Matrix is, is the closest you can come to virtual reality where Neo got plugged into the Matrix and was transported into a simulated world completely where he could do anything that he wanted. And that kind of helped break the ice with people because they could relate to it then. So it, it, I would say, yes, it has been interesting. I would not say challenge, but it, it's been always interesting to talk to people about new ideas and new concepts and how they can relate to it to their day-to-day life and how it could help them. Great. 
So uh, this name uh, Fidgetal is also quite interesting. So is there a story behind uh, choosing that name? Uh, I think yeah. I think everything which kind of happens has a story behind it, right? So Go Fidgetal came about when uh, Hitesh, my co-founder, and I were having a chat. So I, I was by by then I was out of my previous company, and we were looking to set this new venture up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a daughter who's now seven and a half years old, and back then she was like two and a half, three years old. So we were brainstorming about uh, what to do next and how do how does AR VR fit into the whole scheme of things? And Hitesh is very fond. And, uh, he was very concerned about uh, the screen time. I mean, kids today, pretty much everybody is kind of spending a lot of time on their mobile devices and their screens. So we were talking, and he said, "Well, you know what? I'm concerned." spending a lot of time watching a, watching a phone or a tablet. Why doesn't she read books instead? And I said, well, she would love that, but she's just two and a half years old. And how can a book come alive and read back to her is what we need to crack. I mean, and that was our Eureka moment where we said, well, what if the book came alive and interacted with her? And we said, okay, there's a physical book and we, we need a digital app to do that. And that's how how do we get people to go digital? And that's how the name came about go digital. And we said, well, let's not think just about the kid and the book, but how businesses need that because today there is a chain outlet and there is an online uh, presence that they have in e-commerce, but how do you marry the two domains? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, go digital came about pretty much out of a brainstorming session on how to make my kid spend less time on the digital medium and move her to books. And I think, I think we have been fairly successful in doing, in doing both. Uh, she spends uh, a lot of time now reading books uh, and we are helping businesses go digitally. Wow, great. Um, so moving ahead, uh, why didn't you tell us about the market scenario in the AVGC industry in general and the gaming industry in particular? So the AVGC industry also uh, with, with the whole uh, evolution of technology has also grown significantly. I mean, if, if you kind of have uh, followed it over the years, a lot of, in the, in the early years, a lot of the animation work was purely outsourcing work, which came to India, moved from a uh, outsourcing perspective that, hey, India has a lot of animators or, or a lot of game developers and services is something which we kind of built the, the industry in the initial days. But as uh, the industry evolved and as we grew uh, as an ecosystem, we started investing in building IPs uh, over here. So be it in animation, be it in comics, be it in video games. Today, if you see, there are a lot of companies investing heavily in building IPs, which are not only a big success in India, but also globally. I mean, Chota Bhim is, is a classic example of how a homegrown IP has now become a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Likewise, even, when, even with games, I mean, a lot of games which are made out of India are played globally by millions of players, uh, be it on, on mobile devices, uh, on Android, on the App Store, and, and, are, and, and are actually a, a household name in, in a lot of places. So I think IP, the move from services to IP uh, is, is a one big uh, shift. The AVGC segment is a good mix of people focused on creating content and creating content for themselves from an IP perspective. And, and that's a good sign, it's a positive sign. And uh, how do you think will the world industry be effective uh, because of this corona uh, crisis? I think globally every business has been affected, uh, not just business, I mean, every single individual on this planet has been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, having said that, and, and some businesses are hurting a lot more than others, but if you look at the trend in the past couple of months, gaming as, a, as an industry has grown uh, in terms of engagement and consumption, right? People are down, because what do you do when you can't step out of your homes? Well, you download games and you play them or, or you watch uh, online streaming content. So all the OTT apps and all, all the gaming uh, apps which are getting downloaded are getting an audience which is spending a lot of time playing games uh, to keep themselves engaged. And this was a trend which we observed even way back in 
2001, when 9-11 happened uh, and travel was kind of taking a big hit because people stopped traveling because the, the, the whole uh, global travel industry went down uh, when, when the 9-11 plane crashes happened. Gaming was one industry which kind of survived through that also because people were sitting at home and playing games. And, and especially now with devices becoming more affordable, uh, you, you also see seasonal spikes in gaming where on Christmas, when you get a new, new device or a new handset, you see a lot of downloads come around Christmas time or, or around Thanksgiving or in the, at the beginning of the new year. Even now, I think even the, the World Health Organization is looking at gaming as a way to keep people in, indoors. They're saying, stay indoors and play games. So, so that's, that's, really, that's an interesting perspective. Animation, films, and gaming is something which people need to keep themselves engaged and ent entertained, especially when they are locked inside the houses. So definitely these guys are playing a key role. All these content producers are helping people stay home and stay safe. So even the animation film industry will grow because when people are stuck at home, no live shootings are happening. So animation yeah. to rescue. Yes, absolutely. So as a leader, what do you think are the factors influencing a business decision? And I ask this because a lot of our students uh, do not want to uh, begin with a job, but they want to become entrepreneurs in their own right. And uh, we also have a few students who are inclined towards the gaming industry. So uh, if they want to start a new business venture, uh, what factors influence good uh, business decision making? So I think it's a, it's a really good thing that the students are looking at wanting to start something of their own. And we need, we need more entrepreneurs coming into the system to create value and create original ideas which can which can be launched out there uh, but i think i think the primary thing a lot of people need to understand that you are getting into the business not just to create art not just to create content but also to create wealth for all your stakeholders so there has to be a tangible business approach to creating any content that you put out there and you have you already your students already have the talent. It is just how to use uh, it wisely, such that it it becomes also a monetizable approach for these guys to launch the products which which make not only for them but also for their investors. And investors could be anybody. It could be so a lot of people start off uh, putting their own money into the business, and uh, or or borrowing from their friends and families or their relatives and while the the dark side of a startup ecosystem is it is said that seven out of ten startups possibly don't even make it beyond the first 12 to 18 months mm -hmm. but those three startups which survive will go on to create a lot of value for everybody so you just need to make sure that you you have a solid business plan also in place you, uh, a lot of creative people and, and including me, when, when I started off, uh, it was all about being wanted to cre do something creative. And it was only after a few hard knocks that I realized that, well, you may, you may be creative, but you also need to make money at the end of the day to pay bills. So you need to kind of balance the two things such that your creativity also gets you the money to pay the bills. So a lot, a lot of the new students only suggestion or recommendation to them would be that, hey, when you go out there, that I need to make money, not only for myself, but also if, if I have a team in place, which is helping me build this content, they should also get something out of this. So it has, it has to be a commercial plus creative decision. Now, this was is a slightly informal question, like other than your professional success, uh, what do you enjoy doing the most? So I think, I think for me, it's, it's a very gray area because I'm not playing games. So if I'm making games and I'm playing games, it's one and the same thing in my spare time. Uh, especially now that I'm in the AR, VR space, I spend a lot of time exploring new virtual reality-based games and apps which are out there. I, I love watching movies. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, watching movies with my family, my, my daughter. 
uh, I used to love reading books. Unfortunately, because of the whole OTT wave, my book reading has taken a nose dive. So mm-hmm. what the, the time I used to spend reading books or, or catching up on my books on my Kindle, uh, Netflix and Amazon and, and the likes of these apps have kind of eaten into that. But I hope to get back to my book reading very soon. So, uh, so yeah, it's, 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 I, I think it's, a, it's not a defined part of work or play. I mean, I, for me, work and play are, are, are pretty much interlinked with each other. So, and that is so important in life to have, to have. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, now you also have a kid. You are raising a girl child, and uh, you are into playing games. How many hours would you uh, want your uh, daughter to play games? Uh, you know, considering the academic pressure that students have and all. So, I th- I think it is it is. This is a saying which I keep telling people that anything in moderation is good for you. Anything in excess is bad, right? Which is the whole saying when we were growing up that all work and no play makes Jill a dull girl. I mean, it was, it used to be Jack a dull boy. Well, I, I kind of modified it to say it makes Jill a dull girl. <laughs> uh, the whole idea is uh, games are good. Games teach you a lot of good things. Uh, contrary to public perception that, oh, games are very bad or games are very violent. Well, there's a good side of games and there's a bad side of games. And I'm actually involved with an, with an NGO called Responsible Netism, where we advocate about responsible gaming. And we say, hey, look, I mean, uh, one or two hours of gaming over a period of the whole day is not that bad, as long as it doesn't interfere with your education or your exercise, everything in moderation, right? Even, even if you look at exercising, which people say is good, well, but if you, if you do work out for 10, 12 hours a day, it's, it's harmful to you. Or if you, if you drink water, say one or two liters is good for you, two liters of water, this is good. But you go ahead and drink five, six liters of water, that's bad for you. So just like that, gaming in moderation is good. Uh, the time frame can be 30 to 45 minutes per session, uh, depending again on the medium you're playing it on, the platform. So a mobile game, because uh, it's a smaller screen, uh, the gaming uh, sessions are shorter. So that's where those can be a shorter session cycle. If you're playing it on a console or on a larger screen, it could be 25, 30 minutes. And then you need to take a break. You, you cannot continue playing a game for longer than that. Even in virtual reality, I mean, people are playing games wearing VR headsets and they take you to a totally different sense of reality or, or your surroundings. And over there, in fact, they're saying you shouldn't play more than 15, 20 minutes when you're in that world. You should take a break after that because otherwise you tend to lose sense that, okay, what is real and what is virtual? Oh. So my advice to my daughter is, well, do, do whatever you want, but do it in moderation and, and be safe. I mean, the digital world is not a very safe domain out there, right? I mean, especially with multiplayer games, you don't know who you're playing with across the globe. So just be careful of putting in all the security measures in place when you play. Um, and there's also uh, uh, this uh, career of a game tester. So what does it take to become a game tester and how does the, that job look like? So a job of a game tester, I think is one of the very important roles in the entire life cycle of a game because they are the last barrier of checking before the game gets launched into the market, right? And, and if the game has bugs in it, it is because somewhere the game tester was not able to test it completely. So I think for me, a QA guy, a game tester is equally, if not as important as, as a game programmer or as a game artist. A lot of people think of testing is just kind of uh, a, a, a function which is not really a necessary function. For me, it's a, one of the most critical functions. Uh, I mean, we, we have testers who started off as uh, just passionate gamers and, and they have a keen eye for detail. So a lot of our QA guys came out fresh out of college, said, I want to get into gaming, but I'm not an engineer. And they said, hey, no problem. I mean, even I'm not an engineer and I got into gaming. And the, the way I kind of learned about games 
is while playing and testing and figuring out things. So uh, the, the key qualities for a tester is to have a keen eye for detail and to be able to communicate what he or she is facing as a player in the game. So, so it is not just fun, but also game playability testing. So how is the game fun or not for, for the user? And which is what comes through a tester. And, and for me, a testing is not just limited to the actual tester. I mean, for us, when we build a game, we don't give it only to the tester. The tester will do the functional testing, but we also do a focus group. So we give it to other team members within the organization. It could be somebody from finance. It could be somebody from HR who is not really a gamer. But then the, they sit with the tester and when they are playing the game, the QA team will observe how they are playing it and will accordingly suggest the game usage behavior to the development team saying, hey, we need to tweak it this way. So testing is a, a fairly important role in the entire development life cycle. Great. Um, so Nina, uh, here I would also like to tell you what we have been practicing at Veda. See, our college mm -hmm. the 10 years old now, we are going to start the 11th year now. And last, oh, okay. last academic year, we decided to shift to project-based learning. So okay. uh, the entire college was engaged in producing short animation films, uh, right from pre-production, right from ideation, like ideas of a story. Uh, so the university structure is like this. First year students are taught pre-production, second year okay taught a little bit of pre-production, they have storyboarding and then they have post-production softwares and the third year students, they have production. So each of our seven movies, so we, we brought out seven films last year, uh, uh, between July and uh, March. So academic year, uh, so the students would study in the morning half and afternoon, evening, all uh, uh, in that time, they would work on their films. So whatever they are learning here in the first half, they would try to apply it in the second half and work on the, uh, on, on the films. Uh, so each team had uh, some students from pre-production, some from post-production, some from production. So we were kind of following, trying to follow the industry pipeline. Um, and the idea was to, uh, uh, to get students familiar with how things work in the industry. Because usually when students, graduate from college, they don't have a lot of uh, experience of how uh, they, they don't have any idea of how things work in the industry. So, uh, but now since our students have at least one year of uh, uh, experience of film production, uh, what kind of uh, advice would you have for them as uh, somebody who is just going on into the market uh, as a fresher? So what kind of things should they keep in mind? Uh, and especially if they want to join your field. So I think when you step out in the, in the uh, world beyond the academics, there is a, a lot of things you need to unlearn. Because as students, we have, we have been uh, grown in a protective environment, uh, be it a film school or, or be it any, any school or any college. There's a structured approach. Uh, and while in the industry, we try to be as structured as possible, there are challenges at times where we need to uh, we need to kind of improvise as we go along. So the students need to be ready to unlearn and relearn a lot of things they may have uh, imbibed while doing their graduation. Mm -hmm. uh, be, be open to suggestions, be open to criticism. You are getting collective knowledge from a lot of the other experienced people who are already out there creating content, who have already started working before you. And it could, it could come across as feedback, it could come across as criticism, but at the end, it is for your own benefit and for your own knowledge. You already are trained in using the tools. Now you need to learn the, the art of uh, using those tools in a, in a way such that it conveys the story in a, in a better manner. So uh, it's, it's form meets function kind of a play, uh, play where you need to work with a team, be open to ideas, give your inputs, and collectively build something which you are proud of. Great. Uh, 
um and uh, what kind of advice would you like to give our students when they are working on their uh, portfolio and uh, showreel uh, while the student is trying to showcase everything that they know the con the the showreel becomes a bit cluttered if if you have a usp if you are confident that there is one or two skills that you are expert in and, and your level of expertise is to come through in that showreel focus on those aspects choose your uh pro uh, portfolio in such a manner that your skill sets come through clearly look at international showreels which would be out there for you to refer to that what may what would create an impact uh because at the end it is that showreel of 2 3 minutes uh which is going to create that impact for the person at the other end watching it to pick up the phone and call you for an interview so it needs to, it could be a mixture of it could be a combination of you talking a bit about yourself you showing some of your work and uh, you showcasing the whole journey of what uh, how your work has reached what you are show right it is basically you are selling yourself make sure that that 2 3 minute video creates that impact about you both as a person and as a professional for the organization or for the studio to call you to, for the face to face or the, or in the current context for a zoom uh, meeting so that you can you get that face time with those guys and are able to convey it in a much better manner so uh thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving us the time for uh, uh, this uh, very interesting interview uh, i think uh, i got to learn a lot of things and i'm sure my students also would uh, uh, benefit a great deal from this interview uh so thank you so much for taking out the time and talking with us it was my pleasure my pleasure thank you for having me on this conversation and i hope to visit your uh, institute whenever now the situation permits i mean how i heard a lot about veda i would love to come there in person and meet you and your team and your students yes uh yeah, we are equally eager to have you on our campus so of course as soon as the situation eases down we will definitely invite you for a face to face interaction with our students this time yeah thank you so much kushal thank you for having me over